with Samo Buria. He's a founder of Bismarck Analysis and a research fellow at the Long Now Foundation. So Samo, welcome. Thank you for having me on the show. So I want to start out with some questions about history sort of as a field of study. You've got like some really interesting articles that argue that our knowledge of history actually decays over time. Like, what do you think history as a profession could do to slow down the rate that the knowledge is decaying? It's inevitable that we lose sources, uh, both written sources as well as material evidence over time, let alone living witnesses. I feel it is hardly controversial to say that the recently deceased generals of World War II, uh, people such as, you know, uh, you know, Eisenhower and so on that died in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and so on, they knew more about World War II than any single historian does today. This is not to say that there are not uh, certain facts that they, the modern historian might know uh, that some of these decision makers didn't. Uh, for example, you might get to interview both sides of a conflict to a certain extent. There is information that is at the time classified and is not known even by the highest decision makers. But all else equal, even for this recent extremely well-documented event. The people alive at the time straightforwardly knew more about it. Um, and by the way, this is still a surprisingly recent generation, right? As of a week ago, a little bit over a week ago, uh, Henry Kissinger passed away, who was, you know, this very influential statesman in the Cold War uh, in the late 20th century, maybe even as a retired statesman in the 21st century. And, uh, you know, he fought in World War II. So this is still like, again, in the big picture of history, this is extremely recent. Now let's consider what happens if the written sources themselves are not preserved. I think it would be Pollyannish to assume that always the best texts are the ones that are likeliest to be preserved, right? We have some estimates that of the Greek and Roman authors that we know by name, for 96% of them, so for 96% of Greek authors and Roman authors that we know, uh, we only have fragments. We do not have full books. Whenever you have a book preserved, there is an allusion or a reference to a different writer, to a different poet. So 96% of those, we don't have any preserved works. A lot of people will argue that the best, most relevant stuff uh, was obviously passed down through medieval Europe or through uh, Arab civilization. But I really think that that's unwarranted. Let us consider Euclid writing many treatises on mathematics. But, you know, I could quip that Euclid's elements, despite being probably the best math textbook ever written, still used for mathematical education in the 19th century. Uh, even uh, mathematicians such as Hilbert were still mining it for uh, clever nuances in the definitions to demonstrate, you know, advanced mathematics. So we could quip that Euclid's elements were like, you know, Euclid's math 101. And, uh, you know, certainly medieval Europe would not have known what to do with Euclid's math 201 or 301, right? And the same is true of many works of, um, of uh, Archimedes, Heron, uh, theological works that say disagree with prevailing uh, religious or cultural, uh, you know, trends. So I think the evidence is overwhelming that both because of you know, the loss of living memory, that is people who actually experienced the events, also the loss of written sources, and then just the inevitable physical decay of stuff uh, results in us over time knowing less about our immediate past. Now, there are temporary reversals that can happen. The Romans had no idea of the existence of the Hittite Empire, this Bronze Age polity just a thousand years before Caesar that dominated uh, Asia Minor and fought wars with Ramses II and prominent Egyptian uh, rulers. Uh, however, in the 19th century and the 20th century, we've uncovered lots of evidence of the Hittites. We've learned to decipher their language. Uh, we have dug up, uh, you know, their palaces and their buildings. Yet, I'm pretty sure that no matter what we do, a thousand years from now, there will be fewer archaeologically intact uh, sites that bear evidence of Hittite settlement. There will be less left of their cities. And yes, I'm even willing to say that a thousand years from now, there will be less, uh, there will be fewer 
known written sources than there are today. I think the rate of loss, despite uh, you know what we might think of as the advances of digital technology resulting in effortless copying in the big sweep of history, you know, how difficult is it to erase every example of a file in existence? I would say that it's easier to erase every file on every computer connected to the internet than it is to destroy every scroll hidden in a private library. So while we are proud of digital technology, its very interconnectedness might make it vulnerable to either censorship or honestly, natural disasters such as solar flares that might fry all of uh, the world's computers. Yeah, and that actually brings up like a really big question that I, something I think about a lot is like, is having too much information and like too much recordings in the modern age actually a problem for future historians? So if you take like a hundred years from now, like how well do you think they could actually pinpoint the causes shaping this decade or the forces shaping this most previous decade? It seems like people even in contemporary times are like very argumentative without having like a single media or single news source that sort of dictates the narrative. Do you think that the overabundance of information will make us have a more or less accurate picture in the future? I think it is always difficult to navigate an overabundance of information. Future historians will perhaps have the same problems that intelligence agencies do in uh, the present era, where being able to record or retrieve every single conversation by every single you know, extremist international terrorist group doesn't necessarily make you that much better at pinpointing uh, which of these groups is a threat. So in a very real way, the overabundance of information will offer uh, confirming evidence or consistent evidence for many more hypotheses of the present era. So there will be more alternative stories that future historians will have about us, I think, than they do about the Roman Empire or than they do about uh, Aztec civilization. But honestly, you know, we have an overabundance of private letters from the 18th, 19th century, uh, even the 20th century before we abandoned letter writing. You could even joke that when people started, um, you know, using telephones, that that in itself is a little historical dark age since uh, the recordings of those phone conversations are not recorded. Meanwhile, letters of like, again, 18th, 19th century thinkers, statesmen, artists, uh, even m m musicians, religious figures, uh, inventors, those are often preserved unless actively destroyed by their heirs. So there is an interesting situation here where um, we had a medium that was leaving less of a track record. So between 1940 and let's say 2005, when email and text messages became ubiquitous, we might actually have a bit of a record gap. Uh, you know, I don't think, you know, while I mentioned the NSA, I'm sure they're recording many conversations and have been since the 1980s. I don't think those archives will be available to future historians. Um, I do think, though, that they will have a prevailing narrative of our era. Because as great as the overabundance of information they will have about us is, um, they will, in fact, probably follow the most authoritative sources and voices of our era. Now, whether these authoritative, authoritative sources or voices are correct is a completely different matter. But there will be a dominant narrative of our era simply because we have a dominant narrative of our era. If you listen to us over the last five years, you will certainly think the pandemic was a great global event. And if you listen to us over the last 10 years, you will certainly believe, you know, you could sample almost any random article and you would have a good shot of hearing social media mentioned. So, okay, they will believe that we were very concerned and very preoccupied with social media. They will see evidence that we have used it a lot. They will see evidence that we uh, fought bitter uh, political discussions and disputations about COVID. And they will see that we got very enthusiastic about a whole number of technologies, uh, but not all of them really worked out. We were interested in VR, we were interested in Web3, we were interested in generative AI. And let's say maybe one of these actually turns out with the hindsight of a hundred years 
uh, to have been a real transformative breakthrough. And this, from their perspective, all just over 10 years to us, you know, to even talk about Web3 in a, in a tech sense is, uh, feels so dated, but really it's literally two or three years ago, right? That's nothing. Uh, they'll correctly peg us as a bit faddish, uh, a bit concerned over rising tensions with China, uh, very, very much struggling through our own cultural transformation. Uh, for example, I don't know, trans rights certainly will make the history books, uh, economic downturn and high inflation will make the history books. At the end of the day, while this will not be a perfectly objective picture of the 2020s and the 2010s, it will not be an unfamiliar picture. Like to us, at least, uh, we might not like the portrait, uh, but it'll seem an, a reasonably accurate one. Got it. Got it. How well do you think like the profession of history is doing right now? So sort of, you know, if you think of a spectrum, which is on one end, what you just listed was a, basically a bunch of facts that point to the fact that no matter what we do, our picture of history will never be accurate and it will decay over time. But then there's also the job of the historians to say, well, like given those facts, like what is the most accurate picture we can possibly paint? So historians today, like as an institution, where do you think they, they sort of sit on maximizing what we're able to get out of what exists? I think that it's uh, always almost a, a, a deep passion project. And I think professional historians are doing remarkable work in many fields. Uh, I do think there is something of a problem with the deep politicization of recent history, where we upregulate voices that give us, uh, you know, almost comforting revisionist variants of the recent past. For example, uh, do I think I would have an easy time finding an accurate history of women's rights in the 19th century? I think the answer is yes. I would have a hard time because anyone interested in this is almost certainly uh, going to have a career that is advocating a certain perspective on women's rights today. On the other hand, if I wanted an accurate biography of, I, I, I don't know, Napoleon, a Napoleon III, let's say, okay, I think, I think I would even trust a contemporary historian on this. There are some areas specifically where uh, honestly, because of the proliferation of academic positions, because of the proliferation of people with uh, academic degrees, academic credentials, the competition has intensified and there is pressure to be relevant to current debates. And I think that's one of the things history should guard itself from. You shouldn't be too relevant to the present. You're probably doing a very selective and distorted reading if what you're presenting is straightforwardly applicable to the present rather than applicable to the present and to all other eras. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I'm curious about like maybe the most recent large historical event where we have invested tons of historian resources would be World War II and particularly the rise of Hitler and Stalin and sort of the causes here. Sure. It, if they were to read Hitler and Stalin to read like scholarly scholarly work on their rise from today's period, how accurate do you think it would be? And what do you think the reaction would be to it? I think they would find it 90, 95% accurate and or 90% accurate, 5% omitted and 5% they would uh, believe that their enemies had written. Uh, which is history, true. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah, which, which is true, right? Like it, they would, um, I'm still certain that there are still um, details of say the Second World War uh, that are basically uh, classified or misrepresented. Like for example, the Enigma machine, right? That was used to encrypt messages during World War II uh, was broken during World War II. And the fact that it was broken was kept secret until the 60s or 70s. So you had this interesting situations where histories were already written of World War II that did not factor in that in many operations, the allies knew, the allies knew the, uh, you know, what the Germans yeah. were talking about and how they were communicating. And it's, uh, you know, they, the Germans didn't have the element, element of surprise there. I also would not be surprised if 
Uh, for example, some of the intelligence work that was very relevant, again, during World War II, uh, for various reasons, was not disclosed later. But at the end of the day, I think that this historical focus, right, on these very charismatic events might actually be a distortion in its in its its own right, where we can't help but think of 1900s Russia or 1900s Germany as just a prelude to Hitler or Stalin. And I think because of that, we sometimes project backwards when in fact circumstances had changed very rapidly, right? Like, you know, there's a book, um, you know, at the court of the Red Czar, right? Like calling Stalin a Red Czar is an evocative way of calling him a dictator, but it also is an evocative way of like prositing a kind of continuity between Imperial Russia and the Soviet Union that I just don't think is there. I think the transformation of society was too profound and the replacement of the ruling class actually did change the nature of that state very deeply, very significantly. And any sort of historical narrative where, say, the Russians are just predisposed to tyranny, uh, you know, culturally, I think that's just the bias of what is always said of a geopolitical enemy. And I don't think it's a, a very weighty historical evaluation. Why does this all matter? So, like, what would the impact be if we were able to go back and actually just, like, look at how events in Rome unfolded, for example, or in a time where there's been a substantial amount of loss of our current knowledge? Like, what would we gain from this? And how would society change today? Well, I think our, our image of the past would change absolutely massively. For the Romans themselves, they are um, mythologized and they are, to a very great extent, um, idolized, demonized also at times, right? At this point, people will perhaps even critique them. Um, I honestly think that we would find Roman society unfamiliar to us in a lot of ways. I think that we would be somewhat disturbed by their religious rituals because our aesthetics have been transformed by Christianity, even those of us who are, um, you know, atheist um, or of, you know, other religions in the Western world, these sensibilities have been deeply influenced, not just by Christianity specifically, but more and more so by Protestant Christianity, right? So, you know, the burning of incense and lighting candles in front of statues uh, is already minorly exotic, even though it's a very normal thing in Catholic churches and Orthodox churches um, to, you know, to our more Protestant modern standards. And, you know, the typical Catholic mass has moved more towards the Protestant, uh, the Protestant service than vice versa over the last hundred years. You know, how would we react to seeing an actual animal sacrifice? Yeah. I think we would react very strongly, right? Yeah, we might be disturbed by it. We might be fascinated by it. If you look at our fiction, you know, some of the more lurid fiction of the recent uh, past, like, you know, I don't know, HBO's Rome or Vikings or uh, what is it? Even the fictional Game of Thrones, you know, sure, the sex and the violence is there. But like, you know, animal sacrifice, that's just like, wow, that's like an extra disturbing or weird episode. And like, even though we know it's totally fictional. Um, the, the faintest remnant of this might be the, the bullfights in Spain, right? That might be the faintest remnant of the Roman circus still practiced today. And those are, of course, you know, controversial, they're sanitized, they, they're known to be this obscure thing. The other thing that I think would surprise us about the Roman era is that it is an era of machinery, perhaps not of steam engines, but certainly of metal pipes and pumps, right? Um, you know, many people today would be surprised to see Roman firefighters with a mechanical water pump, like a hand-powered mechanical water pump. I think we'd imagine buckets or something like this, right? We wouldn't imagine yeah. that. Yet that is historically very normal. And again, uh, mechanical calculation devices, such as the Antikythera mechanism, discovered, uh, you know, off the coast of Greece in the 19, I, I think 1940s originally, maybe a bit later, uh, but only recently x-rayed and reconstructed showing, you know, uh, clockwork style, precise machinery and probably used to calculate astronomical uh, 
astronomical events and occurrences of various kinds. The reason that would be surprising to us is that I think we are willing to grant the Romans a certain kind of legal and philosophical sophistication, but we are inordinately proud of our own technical and machine achievements. Therefore, we elevate the industrial revolution of the 19th century, the technological revolutions of the 20th, and the computer revolution of the early 21st as unique and historically unprecedented. Yet many societies have achieved significant levels of mechanical and technical sophistication to nevertheless then fail, uh, regress and lose it. I think it is impossible to argue as much as one could argue against the thesis of a dark age by pointing to things like, I don't know, lower taxation or uh, greater freedom or, uh, you know, even at times uh, lower war casualty rates after, you know, the decline of the Roman Empire, it's undeniable that machinery in Europe was much less advanced in the 8th century AD than it was in the 2nd century AD. Uh, and then as a final thing, I think we would be sophisticated, we would be surprised by the sophistication of Roman urban life with details such as public lighting, uh, specialized lanes for transport, street food, um, and so on. I also think we would probably be wowed by Roman pa uh, portrait uh, painting. Uh, the Romans actually didn't just have mosaics and statues and frescoes, they actually had paintings. But of course, paintings don't tend to be preserved over 2000 years. Many people in the written sources describe the paintings as lifelike and realistic. To our shock, we might find that certain Roman artists say used perspective so to the point where if we could see a Roman painting, maybe it wouldn't be that much of an inferior to a 17th or an 18th century painting. And that would also, I think, shake our sense of reality a little bit. Got it. This is a good um, segue into like some of your work on, you know, institutions and societies more broadly. So on this show, I generally like to assume that listeners can do like most of their own background research to get familiar with your work, or maybe I've heard you on other podcasts before, but I think it is helpful to set the stage with a little bit of terminology. Would you mind just starting off with like a super brief intro to the concept of a live player and a great founder? Okay. Um, a live player is basically a individual that can reliably um, demonstrate the ability to go off script um, and either adapt to their circumstances on the fly or derive from, you know, some sort of theory of first principles, what to do, even when there is no exemplar, no uh, pre-existing, uh, you know, uh, pattern to follow. Uh, one of the surest signs of a live player is someone that has succeeded in multiple domains. So it is perfectly possible to not be a live player, to be a dead player and be a very successful professional, or even a very successful academic or a financier or technologist, because you might just be following someone else's career track. You might just be following your industry's best practices and recipes. No dishonor in that. That's something that's, you know, quite workable. Usually when we try to make up stuff on the fly, we're not very good at it. However, I think society needs live players to break the mold, to rewrite the script, to write the first version or instance of a script. Um, you know, people founding computer companies in the 1980s or software companies in the 1990s weren't following an archetype of a startup founder. People today are, right? But were it not for that initial very different approach to business, uh, you know, geeks and, and nerds and garages, uh, I think, you know, we might have actually continued to rely on large corporations such as IBM and these pre-existing corporations. Well, they would have certainly driven some of the same progress we see, but I think not as much. And I think we would be slower overall, right? So one way to think of a live player is that they are, uh, you know, the stem cells of society uh, going where needed and sort of adaptively transforming, the, transforming themselves into what's needed, perhaps even if it's a completely new organ, a completely new tissue in the body of society. 
Yeah. So one thing I've been wondering about is like, do you have any sense or have you found any like common patterns with like the role that an ethical philosophy plays in the lives of uh, live players? So like right now, for example, you know, effective altruism in tech, it's really popular. People are kind of obsessed with a version of utilitarianism, but you know, I find it like super unlikely that this is the way that Alexander the Great, for example, thought about the world or, you know, especially like Jesus or Muhammad, like likely very different ethical intuitions. I'm curious, are there any just like common themes of morality that you see that live players or even great founders uh, tend to have? Almost all of them have extremely developed and unique views of the world. And here again, I do want to make a, a brief clarification or distinction between live players and great founders. All great founders are live players. Not all live players are great founders. A live player might not actually create any lasting institution. They might just engage in historical uh, action. They might just engage in, in vigorous action, discovery of knowledge, etc. But for someone to be considered a great founder in the sense of great founders theory, which I've written about, they would have to found and create a new uh, institution. And the institution has to be load-bearing or very important structurally to where, whatever civilization they happen to be part of. Uh, to give historical examples, like you know, the founder of a great religion uh, might be a great founder. Uh, a lawgiver might be a great founder. Uh, the founder of a particular university could even be a great founder if that university was like you know one of the first or one of the ones that fostered the scientific method or something like this. Uh, the founder of a city could be a great founder and so on and so on, right? There has to be an institutional legacy that far transcends the individual and shapes the civilization in question. And all civilizations are made up of these interlocking, uh, mutually symbiotic institutional aspects. And for almost every complex institution, there usually has to be an individual or a small team that originated it. Now, why raise this with the topic of ethics? Well, I think especially for founders, even more so than live players, they have to have something of a view, intuitive, even if not stated explicitly, of what society is, and more importantly, what human beings are. Any belief about what human beings are almost necessarily entails a normative view of what human beings should be. I think the ethics of live players and great founders greatly differ, but they all have relatively unusual beliefs that if you interrogate them, you arrive at strange places. And with regard to their personal ethics, I think many of them orient very strongly around a personal code of ethics. The code, however, might or might not be harmonious with that of the society they find themselves in. Like, I think it's almost like a operating system for the mind. It's almost impossible to not be very ethical and be a very highly functional individual, right? Uh, yeah. There's an ethos you have to follow. Now, whether you're actually good to other human beings or whether you treat them well or not, that's quite different. There has to be some sort of ideological, ethical, religious, metaphysical, epistemical structuring of the mind. What about like philosophy more broadly? So if you look at someone like Peter Thiel, right, he uh, is known for sort of engaging like very deeply with Rene Girard, Leo Strauss, um, other political philosophers. And he really like brings a lot of their work into the way that he thinks about the world. Do you think that live players tend to do this consciously or is philosophy sometimes in the background? And maybe for Peter, that's just sort of a hobby he happens to have. And, um, you know, it's it, it sort of helps with his work, but it's not core to the foundation. You know, I think that there are deep insights one can derive from philosophy, history, but also there are deep insights one could derive from physics. I think it is necessary for them to have deeply delve into a field or type of knowledge or a tradition of knowledge of some kind. Uh, however, no particular tradition has a monopoly on useful insights. So, for example, if you go deeply into, you know, the uh, scientific and engineering world and come to a good intuition or understanding of who is a good engineer, uh, that can be extremely useful. Meanwhile, if you go deep into the anthropology of René Girard, come to a view and uh, of who is imitating who, that might be extremely useful for investment, right? <laughs>
especially since, for example, right. you know, one could quip that both the adoption of Facebook and the election of Donald Trump are examples of viral uh, imitation of uh, yep. something that other people like. Yep, yep, makes sense. So you have the tagline on your homepage. I like it quite a bit. It says, you know, there has never been an immortal human society and I work on figuring out why. Are there quantifiable metrics you track to like think about the fragility of a society? So for example, if you were gonna stack the US up against China, how would you decide which one is more fragile at any given time? Yeah, the uh, question of statistical measures of society is one that preoccupies much of political science post 1950 and also macroeconomics and so on. I think these measures are at best heuristics and sort of self-fulfilling prophecies where what we mean by a 5% increase in GDP, for example, in 2020 is quite different than what we would have meant by a 5% increase of GDP in uh, 1953, right? One of them would result in more uh, roads uh, being built, more cars being built, more uh, nuclear reactors being built. The other one might result in more computers being built, but it also might result in completely intangible economic growth, right? So I'm not even convinced GDP measures the same thing as it does now versus 1950. And I'm not convinced at all about back projecting it to 1850, let alone 850 AD. I feel all of that work is, you know, it's just mixing. It's not quite like, you know, apples and oranges, but it's sort of like oranges and lemons, at least. It's like, okay, yeah, sure, it's a citrus. It's, it's a relative, uh, but, you know, uh, try substituting it in a recipe, you might have, uh, you know, an unfavorable uh, flavor. And also, I think it leads to deep mistakes and confusions. It is very much possible for a society to have agricultural abundance, but metallurgical poverty, right? It's very easy to have, for example, ancient Sumeria be very, very rich in grain, but actually bronze and gold and silver, let alone meteoric iron, are far more expensive than they would be in Rome. Yet in Rome, the price of grain might be much higher. Their agriculture might actually be worse because they lack certain natural advantages. Honestly, their agricultural tech might, despite all of their other advances over the Sumerians 3000 years ago, it might actually be less good, right? It might actually be less advanced. Uh, the Romans certainly weren't that good at irrigation uh, and farming in those areas. They managed Egypt well enough, but they left that part of the work to the Egyptians and the Greek uh, water engineers, right? But uh, to not get too lost in GDP specifically, that's sort of my objection to trying to find basic quantifiable measures and having physics envy in this sense of uh, trying to prematurely reify uh, concepts and make them measurable. Now, having said all of this, I do think there are things that indicate in a heuristic sense, there are quantifiable measures that indicate in a heuristic sense that a society might be fragile. I think uh, one of the more notable examples of this is gerontocracy, the average age of your ruling class. I think in almost all societies and all places, a very old ruling class is an indication of a relatively stagnant society. Now, stagnancy in a political, philosophical, economic, administrative sense does not necessarily mean that collapse or something like that is near. You could have a fairly stagnant civilization persist for many hundreds of years. However, it does mean that it is vulnerable to shocks and unpredictable events. These events come as black swans and overturn the established way of doing things. And if the ruling class of a society, the administrative class, is very old, they will find themselves unable to adapt. You know, the average age of U.S. congressmen, I think, has gone up by a year for every year for, what, the last 20 years? The U.S. Congress is now older than the Soviet Politburo was in 1988. That's something to consider, right? Where gerontocracy was considered to be a sign of, uh, of Soviet decay in the 80s, right? The, the fact that the uh, premiers and everyone was uh, so old 
China is actually an old, a rapidly aging society, but its average age is for now similar to that of the United States. It's just that its fertility has been much lower for a long time. So the general population in China is going to get much older fast. The ruling class in China has until recently actually not been getting much older, right? They had a power sharing arrangement, a power cycling arrangement. Uh, Xi might have broken this by taking sort of an unprecedented, uh, you know, third term. And, you know, that's, by the way, another reason that when people talk about China as a straightforward dictatorship, they're simplifying. Show me a dictatorship in the history of the world where rulers would retire after a few terms, right? Yeah. This isn't democratic oversight. But I think if we were being accurate political scientists, we would call China something like an oligarchic republic. It has more in common with the power sharing of a Roman consul and the authoritarianism of a Roman consul than it has with the sort of like, you know, Stalin-esque dictatorship of the 1940s and 50s, even if, of course, the Communist Party has a pure monopoly on power and is the ruling faction in China. So even our stories of the political fragility of China focusing, say, on Xi, it's kind of a projection. I think that power sharing and there being many alternate possible rulers or administrators, many senior figures that could step in if the leader is incapacitated, that is a sign against fragility, against instability. Uh, Russia actually on this metric is fragile. I don't know who the second best would be at running the Russian system other than Vladimir Putin. And this might be the result. Uh, this might be the result both of his policies, uh, but it might also be the result of a deep failure in Russia to cultivate human capital. Now, one doesn't need to, uh, you know, endorse Putin. I certainly don't uh, politically or, or ethically to observe he's an extremely skilled politician and has, in fact, uh, retained power and pursued foreign policy with some blunders, of course, but on net, relatively successfully for 20 years. Like if we consider the Ukraine war a great blunder, I don't think it's a greater blunder than the U.S. war in Afghanistan or in Iraq, right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. we have to grade this stuff on a, on a curve, right? And certainly, you know, it's unethical, but when did that matter? in the history of wars, right? All wars are perhaps unethical and evil, but uh, history will never run out of them, nor are statesmen ever uh, going to be absolved from uh, you know, pursuing them, even if only defensively. Still, to say one more thing, uh, people might note the food imports into China as a sign of instability, so the lack of food autarky. I think that we live in some way in a historically novel period where as long as we don't run out of fossil fuels because of artificial fertilizers, famine is a logistical problem. We basically almost don't have famines the same way we did in the 19th or 18th century, where even very wealthy countries might have famine. Or say there, was, there were food shortages in Germany during World War I due to the British blockade, uh, and there was just simply no way to grow more food, even though this was an industrialized developed society. For China today, they basically import a lot of soy and so on from the United States, but they essentially uh, import it as livestock feed. They're basically feeding it to pigs and they consume a lot of pork. So, okay, if the US and other countries stopped exporting food to China today, Peter Zeihan is sort of wrong. China would not collapse, right? While China does import food in every major category, it is only truly dependent for soybeans, of which it imports 85%, mainly from the United States. But it produces over 90% of the wheat, rice, and corn it consumes. Like one of the most interesting things to me about uh, China is that China is actually one of the world's largest absolute number of producers of wheat right? China actually grows yeah. a lot of food. So yes, the price of pork would probably increase by, I don't know, 5x, 4x, if the US were to stop exporting its soybeans. But the wheat and rice would be more than sufficient to feed the population. And also, China's agricultural sector is rather inefficient. 
the Chinese Communist Party has not prioritized developing, industrializing, and mechanizing agriculture. And you might ask why. Well, the answer is, I think if they made agriculture much more efficient and consolidated the many small farms uh, that currently exist, the demand for agricultural labor would plummet, putting even more migratory pressure on its largest cities. We China's built something like 20 cities with over 5 million people over the last 20 years. If you had such a substantial urban migration together with slowing economic growth, they still have good but very much slowing economic growth, you would have mass urban unemployment. Mass urban unemployment is a classic driver of political instability, especially for people who have been recently agricultural uh, citizens. Like one of the reasons that I think 19th century Europe was unstable is because it was undergoing rapid urbanization. People moved from villages to cities, experienced a, com a complete breakdown of their previous way of life, a complete, um, you know, anime that even uh, sociologists of the 19th century like Durkheim observed. And this resulted in them being easy to radicalize, mobilize into movements such as Marxism and communism and later also fascism. I think this sort of development of rapid urban poverty, I think, needs to be understood as a political phenomena, because in an urban context, you in fact have an easier time organizing a large group of people or a mob of people. It is much harder to do that in the countryside, right? The countryside is more dispersed. Peasant rebellions do happen historically, uh, but peasant rebellions are always sort of constrained by the logistics. Uh, it takes a long time for a peasant rebellion to organize itself into a military to overthrow a government. Meanwhile, a sufficiently riotous mob and a sufficiently lackluster uh, security service or an unmotivated security service could cause the end of a regime right away. That's why Tiananmen Square was perhaps existential for China. That student riot in the capital is actually kind of dangerous. Uh, and the Romanian dictator Kosciuszko uh, had basically a complete collapse of his power happen because a giant, you know, a giant crowd of people basically jeered him and the security service didn't like him already. And they realized, wait, we could probably get away with just arresting and executing this guy. And that's what yeah. happened. That's fascinating. I mean, it makes sense that you can't just compress this all down to GDP. I think that's like a common thing people like to try and do. But the one part I want to really dig into is the gerontocracy piece. I feel like the West in general, like uh, throughout all of society is pretty bad at succession problems. So, you know, the average lifespan yes. of the S&P 500 company has been shrinking. It's like under 20 years at this point. You even look at like the you know, the president of the United States is like changing wildly between parties and positions um, every couple of years. Um, it just doesn't seem like there's that many institutions that are really good at succession. And like, may maybe this causes gerontocracy and people to get older. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's directly correlated, but, but I'm curious. I know you've done a lot of work on sort of the succession problem. Like, w what is the West getting wrong with it? I think one of our problems is that we want every position to be tracked. We want a Roman style uh, you know, we don't even think of it this way, but let's put, let's put it this way. In the 18th and 19th century and early 20th century, when people were designing the meritocratic systems that we have, they still thought about the uh, cursus honorum, the, uh, you know, set of offices you're supposed to go through as a Roman citizen to be prepared for the job of consul. We had this idea of showing scholarly excellence through the universities, but until the 20th century, the universities were divorced from power. Going to a good university did not automatically mean a significant state position. Actually going through the military and the military academies and then fighting successfully in a war was a better way to get into state institutions, right? Um, it also wasn't assumed that uh, the universities were the right way to develop economic talent. Uh, it was actually one of the insights of the startup world of the 80s and 90s to rediscover the wisdom that, hey, actually, you know, without a college degree, an entrepreneur is about as good as they would have been with a college degree. It's only a question of whether you give them a chance to be an entrepreneur, right? I think that we are putting more and more people into waiting because we have not made it so that you are supposed to retire from prestigious offices at a certain age. 
there's no more pressure really to step down, which means that whatever senior position, be it a Supreme Court judge, a Supreme Court justice, be it a, the president of the United States, be it a congressman, be it the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, be it the dean of a law school, president of a university, um, whatever position you can think of, all of these positions have very limited incentives to ever step down. Even as you yeah, age yeah. and lose your energy, you can offload your energy to what? Like your aide, your assistant. So what happens, you have a primary position that remains occupied. The person in the primary position stops doing their job. And informally, a much less prestigious and obvious secondary position is created where there's someone waiting. So in other words, we have an old senile king and a prince regent that people don't realize is a prince regent, except this isn't just true of the president, right? It's, I think, true of the current US presidents. There's practically a regency council if we used the Game of Thrones metaphor. Uh, it is true of every top position, right? Why does it take until your 60s or 70s to get tenure in a, as a scientist, to finally be free to research whatever you want? You're practically dead. <laughs> you're going to be dead soon, okay? And I'm sure you're a great expert. And in some fields, large amounts of memorized information are way more useful than fluid intelligence. But in other fields, it's the opposite. You need lots of fluid intelligence. And the memorization is perhaps helpful to how orient other people, navigate, mentor them, but not helpful for doing new stuff. So uh, wouldn't it be more useful if we just picked the top five uh, undergrad student students in the whole country, heck, top 500, and just randomly gave half of them tenure. Let's 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 do this. 500 top students in the United States. We 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 throw we throw a dice for every one of them. They get tenure or they don't, and now they have tenure. All they have to do is go to the university. They don't have to publish any papers. If they show up, their tenure is secure, and they get to be professors and scientists for the next 70 years of their life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because they're probably going to live to 90 if medical technology advances incrementally. So wait, wouldn't that be better? We would have, you know, maybe maybe 80% of them would actually just goof off. But the 20% that wouldn't, that would be the best scientists of that generation, by far the best. So in other words, we've produced this position where there's a primary position, a secondary position in waiting, and it's gotten so bad that the secondary position has a line in front of the door. So there's actually tertiary positions. There's actually like, I don't know, we're like 10 derivatives away from the top position. And this, this traffic jam means that we are all finding new excuses to wait. So if you assume that there's a traffic jam on the road to the top positions and that the pie is not growing because our economy no longer grows. So you can't just have a senior old person and then the economy grows enough that there's, and the population grows enough in an upward pyramid. Uh, that there is another just a senior position. Like 1900s America was creating universities left and right. How many universities does America create today? 1900s America was more like China than we are today. It created whole new cities, right? San Francisco was like built in a generation practically from 1980 to 1910 or whatever. And again, practically rebuilt after uh, the, great, the great calamity, and, you know, the fire and so on. So... I think that there used to be many more equal positions that opened up with the old. So we have a perverse situation where partially because we used to have a society with lots of young people and a few old people, which if you have a population and economic explosion is institutionally, literally a pyramid scheme, right? It's like you work for me and then you create your own company later, or you work for me and by the time we're done, um, our company is going to be worth 10 times more than it is right now. That's very different than being, you work for me, and if you're very lucky, you'll get to do the same job I did at a company about the same size, and you're going to get to do it for like five years rather than 15 years, because you'll be so old yourself when you finally get your turn. So in a word, the inverted age pyramid and relative economic stagnation, together with people not really wanting to retire and spend time with their grandchildren, which I think honestly started with the baby boomer generation. There's no tug in the mind to take care of your family legacy because we're so individualist that the idea of taking care of your family legacy doesn't even enter most people's calculus anymore. It certainly did in the 1850s, 
or the 1950s even. Now, I think we're a much more individualist society than has ever existed in human history. Uh, you know, honestly, I think that even the 1990s are probably culturally closer to the 1950s than they are to today in terms of communitarianism and familial thinking and institutional thinking, right? So adding those three factors together, historically unprecedented individualism, together with an inverted age pyramid. So we have an institutional pyramid scheme, but what's powering the pyramid scheme, you know, new individuals being born into society. If society is a pyramid scheme, it's a pyramid scheme, you know, you, you have no choice. You buy in the moment you come out crying in the hospital, right? You are immediately institutionalized and given your social security number and, you know, good luck. You're now in the pyramid scheme. Now let's make it work. But uh, the pyramid scheme's breaking down because we're not recruiting enough people into it anymore. So those, those problems are really hard to fix. And there are some institutional solutions. Again, in China, the idea is because we're afraid of having another Mao, we cannot allow anyone to stay like chairman for life. We cannot allow anyone to be too long in the senior position, so they're forced out. But even in China, I think they're making a deep mistake. They're relying more and more on their elite universities as their recruiting grounds. And the universities in China have no anti-gerontocratic uh, mechanism built into them. So in fact, that's going to drive Chinese gerontocracy. The more they rely on their university system, rather than party nepotism, the older they're going to get. And, you know, nepotism, we might think of it as bad, but uh, it's one of the few anti-gerontocratic forces in the world, actually. You know, when someone hands off a position to their young uh, son or cousin or whatever, uh, they're not selecting necessarily first for merit, but just because of biology, they are selecting for youth. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm curious, like, also on this, this idea sort of of, like, lasting institutions, what about just capitalism as an economic model? How durable do you think it is? Like if you had to make a guess if capitalism would be the leading sort of economic model in 100 years, what would you put the probability at? Well, I think capitalism does extremely different things depending what it's applied to. I think industrial capitalism is already pretty rare. I think Elon Musk is kind of a weirdo for pursuing industrial capitalism, which is I build a factory, I make a lot of money out of it, I learn a lot about what my factory does, and then I build another factory that makes my factory work better, producing a complementary uh, thing, and I uh, integrate it vertically, and I make even more money on the market, and I achieve even more expertise, and have an even better team, et cetera, et cetera. It's like, it's the Henry Ford playbook, right? And it's obviously also the Elon Musk playbook, and to a much lesser extent, also the Jeff Bezos playbook. But very few people do this. And most of what we think now of as capitalism is sort of managerial capitalism, where it's not the creators of the company or even the industrialists that are doing the managing. Rather, it is this uh, corporate governance structure where the collegiality between members of this governing class, I think, is more important than profits. I don't think the pulling of advertiser money from Twitter, now x.com, was driven by profit. I think it was driven by, no, no, I, I think it was driven by a political disagreement. Later, of course, you know, e Elon doubled down, put some statements out there that could be considered, you know, even more controversial. But let's remember the advertising got pulled as soon as it was obvious that there would be a massive turnover at Twitter and there would be a deep reform of the company and many executives would be fired, right? Uh, as soon as that was obvious, the advertisers pulled money. And as soon as it was obvious that um, there wouldn't be that much censorship, Look, whatever one thinks of it, turns out Twitter didn't need that much censorship. I don't think Twitter is that bad at all right now. You know, I, th I go on there, I would say maybe it's 5%, 10% more uncivil than it was under uh, Lencien regime, right? The previous regime. But I don't think it was necessary. But politically, those jobs were super important, right? And there is a high degree of economic um, and political collusion when you come to the giant institutions like BlackRock and Blackstone and these, these things that are in theory financial capitalism, but through mechanisms such as ESG have begun approaching central economic planning. So I think that the future of capitalism is that every now and then we will experience an outbreak of capitalism in a sector of society where the political forces preventing it have uh, failed. 
and we will see some advances driven by it and some, you know, some externalities too produced by it. And then eventually capitalism becomes politically unacceptable and it is either loudly or silently shut down. In China, you could argue that officially capitalism has been over for a long time. In practice, capitalism has thrived in an unprecedented way for the last 40 years of Chinese history. Like never before in Chinese history have they had as much capitalism as under a communist government. And that's like a paradox to contemplate. Got it. Got it. So you see it sort of as like, we'll get more and more James Burnham style, like managerial class. Every once in a while, you'll find an Elon Musk who will actually go and shake things up a little bit. Breaks the sector and, and then it advances a bit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We're on the trend though, towards more and more managerial. And then at some point, potentially we just kind of, you know, drop it and um, go back to whatever the next thing is. I know that you have some interesting takes on the EU. You know, I've heard you say before that your prediction for them is pretty pretty grim over the next 50 or so years. Like if you were put in charge of ensuring the EU, EU was actually supposed to find its way back to being like a powerhouse uh, over the next uh, 50 years or so, like what's the first thing you would change? Is, is it primarily cultural, institutional, something else? W what do you think is like at the very, very core root of their problem? I think the very core of the EU's problem is that the EU has no way to connect the economic constituency of a large company with the political constituency of the EU class as a whole. The EU has national economic champions. It does not have union economic champions. There is a French company and there's a Spanish company and there's a Swedish company. And whenever you disperse EU funding, you have to give it to all three. It's the joke about, you know, NASA having facilities in all 50 states. NASA doesn't need facilities in all 50 states. There's a reason SpaceX doesn't have facilities in all 50 states, okay? But politically, it's good to be able to say to every congressman, you know, their barrel of fork. And in the EU, all such problems are intensely, are intensified massively. Every economic regulation is secretly a political compromise between five or six European countries right? Every regulation has a constituency of five to six European countries who want the regulation to be exactly that way. And then no European country is truly comfortable with having all of its companies displaced by another EU company. Yet the EU needs to maintain a good relationship with the United States. The United States has scale. So in practice, sometimes all the European companies are defeated by a US company. And you know, some of that, of course, is due to the virtues of American dynamism, but really, a lot of it is just scale. The US might actually come to be as protectionist as the EU is. For example, the discussion of banning TikTok, right? Sure, TikTok might be Chinese propaganda. And yes, it might be bad for the kids, even if it's not Chinese propaganda. But let's be real. If we ban Chinese TikTok, there will be an American TikTok clone five minutes later, and it'll be just as bad for the kids, okay? And also, isn't it interesting and notable that, you know, a country the size of China has a software sector that perhaps less innovative than the United States. They have their own, you know, Google equivalent. You know, they have their own self-driving car equivalent, like Baidu has done both. Why not? They have their own phone companies. They have their own, uh, you know, uh, they have their own uh, Amazon equivalent. Every, you know, Uber equivalent, Stripe equivalent, every software company in the United States you can think of in the last 20 years. The Chinese have their own domestic equivalent because they have a billion people using the internet. And in the EU, the problem is that if the French were to successfully lobby that, you know, there should be a great firewall around the EU and European citizens for privacy or for some other silly reason like that, you know, some fig leaf of an excuse can't be allowed to have Facebook profiles. You know, I still think like the Germans and the French would kind of sabotage each, each other's Facebook equivalent. It would be very hard to get them to work together in that way. So that's that's problem number one. And I think problem number two, the EU doesn't have its own military. Uh, and the United States, again, it's a very capitalist country, but it's also a very militarily powerful country. The greatest fundraiser on the planet is the Pentagon. And the many trillions of dollars that it spends a lot of it goes into technology R&D. And it used to be the case and still is somewhat the case that a lot of that technology uh, is then commercialized. 
uh, consider the self-driving car technology that is currently slowly reaching roads. The beginnings of that in the early 2000s were DARPA grants for self-driving vehicles, right? Obvious military application, obvious civilian commercialization once you have the military application. How much of aerospace technology was, uh, you know, a side effect of the military necessities? Uh, how much of rocket technology was driven by ICBMs? You can keep on making a long list. The EU tries to fund scientific projects because it doesn't have a military to achieve similar, uh, basically, investments into basic research. But because there's no military contractor and because the market is fragmented in this way, there's also no commercialization. While they successfully fund basic research, they don't successfully economically capitalize on it. Uh, so things like the fusion reactor, the international uh, fusion reactor exp experiment, I ITER, or the Large Hadron Collider, these are like 50 to 60% EU efforts uh, because the EU is trying to fund this basic research to such a great degree. Uh, also things like Galileo, which is the satellite network that is supposed to compete with the American GPS system. Galileo is a civilian system for navigation. GPS was originally a military system for navigation. So all of these small ways, the, all of these small things really add up and solving then the problem of basically European mega corporations that uh, get to compete within the entire free market of the EU, the common market as a real entity, combined with, well, an EU military that can do procurement and uh, buy advanced technologies. These are just not things that are going to happen soon. And then the final one, I think, is more cultural and ideological. Europe has not experienced real fast growth since the 1970s. It's been so long since we've had good economic growth that people have sort of given up on it. In the United States, there is some risk that it becomes a society like this, but it at least had the tech boom. And that was culturally a kind of advantage. And, uh, you know, I think tech is very much a winner takes all game. People have been trying to decentralize it even within the United States and it's not working. Like Austin and Miami are not quite working out as alternatives to Silicon Valley. And even New York sort of, you know, you can have a good software company in New York. You can have a good tech company. Um, but sure, why not go to here? Why not go to the Bay Area? So if even in the United States, it's super centralized, how could you possibly have a European Silicon Valley without a great firewall of Europe or without defeating America's Silicon Valley, which actually the U.S. government might not be happy with, right? The U.S. government, if there were a hypothetical yeah. European tech talk, the U.S. government might find reasons to harass it, just as the EU is finding reasons to harass Google and Microsoft and, uh, you know, even OpenAI or whatever. They know where the tax revenue is going and it's not yeah. to them. Yeah. Yeah. So not, not an easy problem to solve. No, it's um, not. It's very, it's very tricky, very hard. Um, but even look, even if they did something basic, like sure, we're going to be a, a carbon neutral economy, but we're not going to decrease energy consumption. We're instead going to order 400 French nuclear reactors and just build them everywhere. And maybe we make the French nuclear company, like maybe we have it, give it a shareholder structure so that they pay taxes to all 27 member states instead of just France or something like that. Like even that would be ambitious and cool and make them energy independent from Europe and would probably drive down, not up the cost of nuclear reactors because of uh, unit economics. Yeah, actually, I find this point of yours really interesting. So this is a little counterintuitive, right? Um, like if we want to make the transition to green energy, whether it is nuclear or solar, I've heard you sort of state before that actually we would need to increase our aggregate energy consumption. Do you mind just like expanding on like why that's true? I feel like this is something that if you were to ask the average person, they'd probably not be able to work it out. But I think it's a really interesting perspective. Well, let's put it this way. Every uh, ton of carbon that is emitted into the atmosphere, right? For every ton of carbon that you save by making your light bulbs or heating or transportation more efficient, right? You have also reduced 
energy demand for a ton of fossil fuels. So in other words, you make your economy super efficient so it runs on less energy. You have reduced demand for oil and coal. Congratulations, you have made oil and coal cheaper, right? So reducing yep. your energy consumption will always make fossil fuels cheaper. I don't know how to express this more clearly. Unless yeah, you tax yeah, yeah. them absurdly, it will always make them cheaper. And if you tax them absurdly, then you will become poorer because you are taxing energy and you are taxing the production of stuff and the doing of things uh, and just disincentivizing it full scale, right? So the only way really to um, make fossil fuels history would be to raise the cost of fossil fuels massively by increasing demand massively and by incentivizing technology to be developed that has unit economics that beat fossil fuels on some margin. And say, I think that if we were to be a civilization that needed to build thousands of nuclear reactors rather than dozens, they would, we would start making them uh, in a standardized way. And yes, there would be some meltdowns, but look, one person or so died in Fukushima, not thousands, right? The Fukushima disaster wasn't a big disaster at all. And we're not the late Soviet Union, though we are, you know, becoming stagnant, bureaucratic and incompetent in various ways as well. So even the normal, typical nuclear accidents aren't that bad. If you built a thousand examples of a reactor and three of them melted down, you would know the exact ways in which that type of reactor melts down. And then version two of that same reactor would be, uh, you know, much safer. And if you build a thousand of them, every single component that you're building is uh, uh, cheaper per unit because you don't have to cover the expenses of all the equipment that's necessary to manufacture it. Let's put it this way, um, for building a car, doesn't matter if it's internal combustion or an electric vehicle, for building a car, you need about a hundred machines, each at least as complex as the car in the factory, in the car plant that's manufacturing that car. So if you build a factory to build 10 cars, those are 10 really expensive cars. If you build a factory to build a thousand cars, well, those cars have gotten cheaper, but are still expensive. But if you built 50,000 of them or 100,000 at that car plant, suddenly each individual car is fairly cheap. And that's the basic logic of industrial society. Finished goods become cheaper the more of them you sell. The more of them you sell either to consumers or the military or large organizations, it doesn't matter. The more of a unit you sell, the cheaper it gets. Raw resources, yes, there's demand for raw resources, but there's always usually some form of substitution. Uh, you're basically making the like processing of raw materials cheaper and cheaper. Uh, per unit of processed raw material. Uh, now, there's an argument that eventually industrial civilization hits the limit of resources, and that's when consumption becomes more expensive. But I think the evidence is overwhelming. We might have hit environmental damage barriers, but we've not run out of resources at all. Not even oil, right? Not even oil that was 10 or 20 years ago, people were predicting peak oil. I think uh, fracking is like proven to be a very viable technology. Uh, to extract more of it. So, yes, I think that nuclear reactors especially could be standardized, could be made much cheaper, could be made much safer. We would have to build a lot of them. And the only reason to build a lot of them is if we needed a lot of energy. And, uh, you know, our problem kind of is, I don't know if we know what we would do with 10 times more energy. I mean, I can imagine yeah. it. It's sort of Imagine grid electricity is so cheap that you just synthesize jet fuel. Uh, heck, make it carbon capture jet fuel. You pull carbon from the air with your superabundant electricity and make synthetic jet fuel. And then you have, uh, you know, supersonic flights, which are super fuel inefficient, but it's okay because it's carbon neutral because you're synthesizing the fuel. Or maybe you have uh, maglev style trains everywhere where you have levitating superconducting trains zipping across the continent that's energy intensive um maybe we all have uh you know much more um excavation and all resources are much cheaper because you know energy hungry robots 
are the ones doing the digging up of the iron ore and the coal and the uranium that we need rather than humans, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe we have giant GPU farms powering our AIs and powering our crypto hashes or whatever, right? All of this stuff is you can come up with reasons to do it and you can describe how we would be all better off once you do have that much cheaper energy, but it's really not clear where the demand for energy is going to come from and whether the demand for energy is going to be politically allowed because we've now reached a point where energy consumption is a political negative, right? The easiest way to reduce carbon emissions is to decrease living standards. Any and all economic growth increases absolute carbon emissions, even if you do it in a green way. So I don't know, we're kind of stuck. Is this, is this an argument that's being made by any country, other countries out there or any like organizations within the United States even, or is this like completely against the popular narrative? I think there are individual experts who will say this happily, who work in various kinds of energy abundance uh, thinking, uh, but it is mostly not in any country's official policy to pursue energy abundance. Uh, there are developing countries that say, we need to have as much cheap energy as we can to become rich, and then later we will become clean and energy efficient. That's a slightly different argument. It looks very similar at first because you're building a lot of coal plants and a lot of nuclear plants. Like China right now is building more nuclear plants than any other country in the world, but they're not really planning on this to be a big part of their energy mix. They're just building a lot of everything, hydro, solar, and coal and nuclear. So, uh, you know, their goal, by the way, is to reach the energy consumption of the United States. So, so they have the target of being as good as the US at energy consumption, but having a cleaner energy mix. Uh, so that's the closest I can think of globally. But, you know, I would really find it cool. You know, I would, I would be more optimistic on the long-term future of China if they were to declare, no, we're not just catching up to the United States, but we as a society, are going to have 10 times more energy per citizen than the United States. And then the citizens and our entrepreneurs and our scientists are going to figure out what to do with this super cheap energy. Like if China decided for some strange communist reason to radically overbuild nuclear power, I think it'd be amazing. I think, you know, they could desalinate all the water they would need for their population. No water shortage ever for them, right? And, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, I think it'd be a pretty good subsidy to their economy because while there would be a glut of energy, it would be baseload power. So power that's always available. And, uh, you know, citizens and Chinese entrepreneurs could find ways to use it. And another thing, by the way, uh, people talk about automation as replacing the aging population in uh, Japan, Germany, and ever more so in the United States. There's no such thing as low energy automation. Automation yeah. is always using grid electricity and sometimes fossil fuels directly to replace intelligent human labor with fairly dumb machine labor. And if you replace intelligent human labor with intelligent machine labor, well, we're discovering that is pretty energy costly too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. So, so China could even maybe help speed up its own automation, right? And that transition, if that, if that idea is to work. But I think in the West, we want both of it. We want to be much cleaner. We want the energy, we want the GDP to go up, but consumption to stay low. Though that's a contradiction. Number yeah. three, we want to be automated, but we want to be automated without changing anything. We want to be green. We want to be green, but we don't want solar panels covering the Sahara Desert or covering fields and forests. We want solar panels that are like picturesque little things that you put in a subsidized way on people's roofs. Everyone wants to have a solar cell roof. It's nice to own capital, but let's be real. Once solar becomes cheap and effective, you're going to buy power from the grid and there's going to be some giant place somewhere where land is cheap. It's going to be covered in solar panels. And that doesn't feel very aesthetic, but it's what happens actually, you know, like your competition, once solar is good, your competition won't be the coal plant. It'll be a giant solar farm 10, 20 miles outside of town. Like that's going to be your competition for selling solar back to the grid from your roof. I see. I see. Well, if, yeah. if we miss, if we miss nuclear, like for whatever reason, right. Say that we just are never yeah. able to get it together for reg regulatory reasons or something. Do you think that solar like could be 
it could handle the 10 or 100x society for, for um, consumption. I think solar is actually one of the few reasons to be optimistic about green tech stuff. It's all kind of a wash. It all doesn't make sense. But solar is the closest to making sense because it is undergoing technological improvements every single year in cheaper manufacturing. And yes, people point out, hey, China is burning coal to make solar plants that are then installed in California. And I will say to this, even without the subsidies, there are many use cases now where, in fact, it is reasonable to buy solar cells. Sure, in a purely environmental sense, a solar cell isn't so much a green energy source as it is a coal battery that requires the sun to activate, right? So you spend about, you burn about as much coal, uh, a, a little bit, you, 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 burn, you burn some amount of coal in China, and then the solar cell releases that plus slightly more electricity once it's exported and installed in California or in Germany or something like this. Still, however, they keep getting better every year. Coal does not keep getting better every year. Energy storage is a significant problem. But if the solar cells keep improving for 10 or 20 years, we might have an absurd situation where daytime electricity prices are extremely cheap. And then we might actually want or find uses for them. One of the uses that I think is actually already helpful is the synergy between solar cells and air conditioning. Around the world, the places that most need air conditioning are often the sunniest places and the air conditioning is most needed when the sun is, you know, when the sun is uh, scorching the earth. So in places like Saudi Arabia and places like Mexico, places like Texas, California, Spain, you know, uh, global warming might be less deadly than feared because we will sell a lot of air conditioning and the air conditioning will be powered mostly by solar because the demand will be during daytime. The other uh, synergy that might eventually come into play, uh, it depends because the facilities are very expensive to construct, is solar and water desalination. If electricity is extremely cheap during daytime, maybe you operate your desalination plants during daytime, desalinating large amounts of water. And then, of course, the water can be used anytime. I think batteries do not make sense for the grid. I don't think batteries will ever scale enough that we could just, you know, a city has a giant battery and the battery charges during daytime and it, you know, releases energy during nighttime. I, I don't think we're ever going to have that in particular. I think the battery economics are going to be absolutely beautiful. We're going to have very good electric cars. And honestly, we might have wireless household appliances. Imagine the joy of like, you know, your, your coffee bean grinder, like that little thing you have maybe on the counter that look, looks so nice and aesthetic. Imagine that, but it doesn't have a wire. And imagine not only that it doesn't have a wire, but you don't swap batteries. You just put it on your charging counter, just as you might put a phone now on a wireless charging station. Imagine just putting your like, you know, coffee bean grinder on your kitchen wireless charging station. I honestly think it would make cooking way more pleasant if all of these yeah, like, yeah, small yeah. <laughs> appliances were like battery powered. And that's the kind of thing that becomes viable if batteries get another 100x uh, cheaper per unit of stored energy. Like we yeah, might get a yeah. lot of uh, a consumer electronics convenience. We forget that like, you know, the better the battery gets in a phone, the, the better the camera gets, the better the screen gets, mm -hmm. uh, the better the compute gets. So we have been actually enjoying a secret battery revolution all along. Every piece of technology you looked around in the 1990s home, all of those electronics from the digital camera to the Game Boy or whatever, they were only enabled by batteries being better than they were in the 70s. Not just microchips, batteries. And every laptop or smartphone that we use today is only possible than now, and it would not have been possible in 2005 because the batteries have gotten better as well. So while the chips have gotten better, they've gotten more energy hungry. The screens have gotten better, but they've gotten more energy hungry. And the cameras have gotten better, but they've gotten more energy hungry. So all of these things added together, uh, you know, just means that there is a revolution hidden from the consumer, which is this improvement in batteries. But really what batteries do currently is take grid electricity and store it for later use. I don't think they can even out the, gre the grid. So my bet for an economic future is when solar cells become cheap enough to power daytime electricity, we will have 
uh, natural gas powered peaker plants that will come online dynamically to provide electricity for when the sun isn't shining. Because natural gas is the cheapest and most adaptable fossil fuel for peaker plants. For coal, you want to burn your coal 24 7. Uh, for oil, well, oil is a bit too pricey. For natural gas, actually, it's very easy to spin up the turbines and spin them down. And, you know, natural gas plus solar, that's still going to be emitting some carbon, but less carbon than if the same amount of electricity was provided by coal. And I think the, the lines will cross where the solar plus natural gas combination will be just cheaper than coal. And then for the first time ever, we might actually see a global drop in carbon emissions. Samo, we've covered a ton of ground today over all sorts of topics. Where can people go if they want to find more of your work? Well, for uh, some of the more economic, technological, institutional analysis topics, I warmly recommend subscribing to the Bismarck Brief. Uh, you can find it at brief.bismarckanalysis.com. Uh, you can also find my essays or writing at samoburia.com. Samo, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Yeah, likewise, Dan.